welcome to Lecture 17. Here we are already at Lecture 17, and it's May 28th, 2014. Um, here's uh, some outstanding reading, although there is one bit of reading that I wanted to um, uh, add to this, which I forgot. And, and uh, one was basically uh, one of the papers that I put on the Canvas Bulletin Board, which is the Fujishigi Naisotani paper. And I believe that is 2009. And then the other reading that I wanted to add was, I'll put it up at the top, was um, the Wolf paper from, um, I believe, 1976. Is that right? 1976. So just to, to avoid confusion, there's, there's two Wolf algorithms. Okay, so the first Wolf algorithm which is the Frank Wolf algorithm came out in the 1950s. And that's basically the algorithm that some people called conditional gradient. And that's actually useful for convex optimization in general. And that, that's basically very simple where basically you have a convex function, you take a subgradient, and then you minimize the subgradient, which is a linear function subject to the convex constraints, and then you repeat. And that's, that's basically the Frank Wolf algorithm, very simply. The second, what's sometimes called Frank Wolf algorithm is not a Frank Wolf algorithm, it's just a Wolf algorithm. And I believe I've even also made that mistake. But the second Wolf algorithm is just Wolf, and that's the Wolf algorithm from Wolf from 2000, and, oh, sorry, from 19, from here, this paper. And that, that one is basically uh, trying to find the minimum norm, minimum two norm of a vector subject to the vector being in a, in a polytope. So that's a particular uh, algorithm. And that's the one that we're going to, that use to, to do for our final project, which is, I guess, two weeks from tomorrow. So you guys hopefully have started reading on this. So I, I'm going to give a detailed lecture on that algorithm on Monday's lecture, so that I will have pictures and geometry and all sorts of fun stuff. I'm actually preparing that lecture over the weekend. I don't even have that ready yet. But I think uh, there, I looked around, and there isn't really a great description of the algorithm. And, but if you look back at the Wolf paper, that's probably one of the better places to actually find some of the details of the algorithm, although the notation that he uses is maybe uh, not uh, as easy to parse as hopefully what I think Monday's lecture will entail. Um, and that's the algorithm that then Fujishigi realized in the late 70s and early 80s would also solve the minimum norm point problem. The one that we proved a couple of lectures ago would give us the solution to the submodular function given, you know, we used the depth and the sat uh, proof. Uh, but it's also, there's another proof that we'll see on Monday on uh, looking at convex duality, about how that guy solves the problem that we want. Um, but uh, before we do that, I want to spend today uh, going through um, material about the Lavas extension, more, more about the Lavas extension, and see how it's uh, the same as a form of integration, the Choquet integral. And we'll, we'll see a number of properties and examples, and uh, ultimately will lead to um, Submodular function minimization, which I think will spill into m Monday's lecture. Um, now, the other thing I wanted to mention was that I had originally said I would give a lecture on Monday by YouTube only, but unfortunately, just circumstances were uh, children being out of school and other th sorts of things, and uh, basically, it, it was impossible to finish that lecture by Monday. So today is actually Monday's lecture, but th what that means is that um, we have three more in-person lectures, and then during finals week, I will do one last lecture which is YouTube only. Uh, that will be our catch-up lecture. Um, now, what, what this means also is that for those of you interested in submodular maximization stuff, since essentially what we've been doing is concentrating on the submodular minimization stuff, which, you know, arguably itself is quite elaborate and involved. But um, I was planning um, to have two lectures on submodular max-like stuff. And that will be next Wednesday, a week from today, and also the one YouTube lecture. And unfortunately, this, this quarter, there was another lecture, a couple of lectures I had on um, the partial order of the extreme points. It's basically more properties of uh, the extreme points of the, of the submodular polytope. And um, there's some interesting properties uh, that, in fact, these extreme points correspond to, there's a lattice of extreme points. And um, we were going to go through that, but I think we're, gonna, we're not going to do that this quarter. Uh, but that's, that's actually very important to understand some of the combinatorial algorithms for submodular function minimization. But I also got word, by the way, I might as well tell you that um, I'm slated to teach submodular functions again in 
uh, when is it? Winter 2015, which is actually not that long from now. Now, normally, you know, a class like this doesn't um, have uh, such a short amount of time between instances of it. But uh, what I was thinking, and this was actually Chandrasekhar's suggestion, was that there could be a part two of survivor function optimization. And uh, a lot of the things that we said we were going to do, like, for example, getting into some more of the details of the combinatorial algorithms for some module function minimization and also talk about other constructs like the principal partition and various different clustering procedures and there are a lot of other things that we're, we're not getting to yet and also some of the algorithms associated with a lot of the details of the algorithms of submodular max. So what I might do um, is if, like, maybe I could get a brief survey. So if, if I were to teach an advanced or, or maybe a part two of submodular function min Sorry, of submodular functions and optimizations in uh, in winter. Um, why don't I do this? I'm going to turn around so that <laughs> you raise your hand and then somebody tell me how many people. Actually, that's not good. That's just silly. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I trust you. You trust me. You know. So, uh, how many people would like to take such a class, like in a, a part two? Um, you would. Why? Why wouldn't you? Okay. You you fail this class. Okay. No. <laughs> Okay, everybody, everybody raise your hand. No, I'm joking. So a, a good majority of you. So I think we could do it if, I mean, we could turn it into more like a, and we could still do this lecture thing and I could put the lectures on YouTube and everything, but I think we could turn it into hopefully more of like a discussion thing if, if there's not enough people. Uh, if it's like, you know, 10 people interested, I think that would be fine. I mean, if, if only 10% of all 100 of you are interested in this part two, I think that would be okay. So. So maybe we'll do that, but that's an idea. Okay, so let's get on to um, the review. So, so last time, uh, by the way, if you're wondering why these question marks are here, this is, a, this is a LaTeX problem, which I haven't figured out precisely the best way to solve yet, but I'm aware of them and there's no great solution yet. Um, and if you're interested, ask me after class what the details of the problem is and I can tell you. But remember, um, we had, um, um, uh, the minimum norm algorithm um, defined the minimum norm point algorithm in sublinear function minimization. And we proved last time that we define basically Y star, which is basically the non-positive entries of the minimum norm solution. And then we defined A minus as all the negative, as the elements corresponding to all the negative entries of Y and A naught corresponding to all of the non-positive entries of the original minimum norm point. And if we define uh, y star a minus and a naught that way, then we, in this min-max duality um, equation that we, that Edmund proved, we actually have a solution um, to the max uh, and also a solution to the min, which is tight, thanks to strong duality. We proved this in, in quite, quite a bit of detail last time. And we also showed that we can get, if we have the depth function, if we can do depth queries, we can essentially um, get all of the solutions. So if we're able to, to implement depth, which uh, may be possible. And that's actually one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about it. Depth is actually possible to implement in n squared time, believe it or not. Uh, that was the lecture that we're not talking about this time. But we can get the depth. Um, um, then we can get all solutions. Uh, in fact, there's, there's a little bit uh, other stuff we can get as well. So um, there's, uh, which I'll talk about um, at some point. But the other thing I wanted to, uh, so then the other thing we started talking about was the, um, Lavasse extension, and uh, we were given a submodular function, and um, we have a W, which is a vector in RE, and we um, we order the elements in decreasing according to W, and then we can define we, we can define a function f tilde of W, which is the solution to this optimization problem, which we know is solved by the greedy algorithm in these various different ways, right? And where this is the chain, this thing at the bottom is the chain corresponding to W. So that's always a W dependent chain at the bottom. That's really important to remember that there's always a, an implicit dependence on W. And so therefore, when we, we can define this continuous extension of the submodular function this way, right, where we just define lambda I appropriately. The, here, here are the values of lambda I. And, um, <coughs> but on the other hand, we can, we can actually define it according to this lambda I for any arbitrary submodular, for any arbitrary function that's not even necessarily submodular, because if we define it in this way, where you know we define the lambda so that uh, w is equal to 
uh, essentially an interpolation of the characteristic vectors of E, where E is the chain which is produced based on sorting into set in order the W, then we can actually define a function F tilde of W for any, for any discrete function, even if it's not submodular. And moreover, no matter how, no matter what the function is, we're going to have that it's um, tight at the uh, characteristic vectors of the sets A. So what this is saying is the following, that, um, that um, I actually, I, I should have put a um, slide here. Let, let me just add a, a new page to describe what I mean, what's going on here. Okay, so we have, I mean, in general, we have like a hypercube, right? This is the hypercube. This is in 3D, right? And so these are the points. So maybe like this is 0, 0, 0, and this is 0, 0, 1. It doesn't matter. However the axes are labeled, each one of those points, maybe this is 0, 1, 0, and so on and so forth. Um, each of the points corresponds to a characteristic vector of some set. Okay, so like, for example, this guy might be if this is e one if if this is uh, if the points are labeled e one e two and e three, then this would be one of a with a is equal to e three, right? Now, you know, it's hard to visualize taking a function, but then we can extend this function so that anywhere either on the boundary or in the interior of this hypercube, we have now a continuous function because we can take some w, which is in, say, 0, 1 to the e. Right? This is any point in the interior, and we can extend that function. So now maybe it's a little bit easier to um, certainly draw this in 2D. So let me just draw it in 2D. So here's, the, here's an example of maybe the uh, two-dimensional hypercube. So the two, uh, sorry, the one-dimensional hypercubes. In the one-dimensional hypercube, we've just, it's just a binary function, right? It's just a zero or one. So it's a function of zero and one. And we have some value, right? So maybe this is the value at zero, and this is the value at one, right? Now, there's a number of ways of possibly, you know, extending this function, right? We could... Oops, that's not what I want to do. And what I want to do is copy this figure. <laughs> well, that is not what I want to do. So um, let me just draw it again, OK? I don't know why this is doing this crazy thing. So. Um, So we could extend it with a convex function. We could extend it with a concave function. We could extend it with another concave function or another convex function. You know, a convex function that looks something like maybe this. We could extend it with a convex function that preserves minima, right? For example, that one. We could extend it with, and that's a linear function. We could extend it with a, um, a, a, a strictly convex function that's not polyhedral that preserves minima, right? Or we could preserve it with a concave function that preserves minima. Basically, all sorts of ways. So basically, in, in any in any case, when you have a n-dimensional hypercube, you can always come up with a convex extension or a concave extension, right? So that's convex in the interior and on the boundaries, or convex in the exterior and the boundaries, or anything that you want, basically. If you have a higher enough, high enough polynomial, you can fit all of these points that you want. Higher, higher enough order polynomial, you could fit all these points that you want. And you can have a concave extension or convex extension. Now the question is, we've got this Lavoisier extension, which is, is going to be a type of extension okay, of the points on the hypercube. Because on, on the vertices of the hypercube, that corresponds to the characteristics of the sets. Now what we're going to see is that the Lavoisier extension has the property that it's equal that it is, in fact, truly an interpolation 
of the points on the hypercube, and it, but it has some nice properties. So let's just summarize what we've got. This, this, is, this is the slide that I wish I had last time. So if, if the function is submodular, then we can write an extension in this way, right? And that's clearly convex because it's the max of a bunch of linear functionals, right? And it's also, thanks to Edmund's greedy algorithm, possible to write it in this way, right? Where the weights are the, you know, where the lambdas are basically an interpolation, right? So that you've got an interpolation of the characteristic vectors of the chain corresponding to the sorted descended order of W, the argument of the function. And uh, we're also interpolating the function. Now, on the other hand, sort of conversely, for any function f, even non-submodular, we can produce an extension having this property, okay? Which might or might not be convex. Right? Now, in both equations 7.1 and 7.2, it's, it's truly an extension in the sense that on the vertices of the hypercube, we re recover the original values of the submodular function, right? So regardless, even when it's not submodular, we have this property down that I, in the bottom, which I just said, I just highlighted in yellow. Okay. But, and we also saw that submodularity is sufficient convexity, is sufficient for convexity, meaning that if it's submodular, then we're guaranteed that this is convex, 17.1 is convex because it's of this equality here, right? Because of the Edmonds algorithm. Now the question is, is it necessary? And that's what we proved last time, which is that it's necessary and sufficient. That basically, the function that we're using to construct this extension leads to a convex extension in this fashion if and only if the function is submodular. So what happens is that we're taking these points on the hypercube, these vertices of the hypercube, and coming up with a convex function, which is an extension. And it's only the case that this particular form of extension with these sums of these lambdas, that happens to be convex if and only if the function is submodular. So is that, is that clear? I think that's, that's very, very, that should be very, very clear. Okay, any questions on that, on that point? Is that super clear to everybody? So I think that that's, um, I'm just gonna drink some water here. I don't want to get the water too close to the laptop, otherwise the lecture will suddenly stop. And nobody will learn anything f further. Okay, so I wanted to make a couple of connections to, um, first of all, um, so Lavasse extension. So it, this, the Lavasse extension was sort of um, based on, on a lot of facts that um, Jack Edmonds proved in his classic 1970 paper, which I mentioned last time, and arguably, as I've said in the past, in, in public, um, one might give more credit to Jack Edmonds even for the Lavasse extension than, than Lavasse. And I don't know, it's a debate whether or not it should be called the Lavasse-Edmonds extension uh, or the Edmonds-Lavasse extension. But um, there's actually an instance where this extension even occurred earlier in the early 1950s um, based on uh, uh, an integral defined by Choquet, which is a, he was a French mathematician in the 1950s. Um, and he was doing this in the context of game theory in the early 50s. So before, we, let's just define that and talk about aggregation and aggregation strategies. So when we talk about any kinds of integration, we can sort of um, think of integration as any type of, of summation or sort of a generalized summation. In fact, with the whole idea of Lebesgue integration, this is the definition of, of generalized, most general Lebesgue integration based on a measure, mu, and Without actually going into the details of Lebesgue integration, basically it is a form of sum, summing um, of sets where, and then here we sort of have the sum, a, a sum form. Um, Lebesgue integration becomes much simpler when we have finite discrete spaces. The nice thing about Lebesgue integration is that it combines the finite discrete spaces and continuous spaces into sort of one particular general, generalized integration strategy. Um, but in finite discrete spaces, Lebesgue integration is really just summing. It's really just weighted averages. And it's also seen as essentially a form of aggregation. It's, like a, it's a form of a linear aggregation, in fact. And so what do we mean? So let's say we've got some weight vector. And let's say that we're restricting the weight vector to be inside, be in the um, interior on the boundary of the hypercube. And we have some x. Then we can take the weighted average of x. So this is the weighted average of x relative to uh, w which is basically the dot product, okay? 
just like a weighted average guy. And if we take the indicators, of the characteristics of the, of the, you know, the axes orthogonal bases, which is one sub e, with the weighted average of, of these points, of these particular vectors, these one vectors, are just the coefficients, just the weights themselves. Right? So when we average those directions based on this weight, we just get the, the values. So what we see is that this whole function up here is specified by the weighted average functions valuations just on these sort of this particular subset of the vertices of the hypercube. And just to make sure that this is clear, let me draw this picture for you. So I'm not very good at drawing hypercubes, but let's try. Okay, so let's say that this is the um, this is the zero 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 point right here. So this guy's zero down in the lower left, and this let's say that this is uh, one of e one. This is this is this point here. But this point here is one of e two, and this point here is one of e three. Okay. So these blue points, the evaluations on these blue points are all that's necessary to define the function. But we have all of these other points that I'm just highlighting in yellow, which are not used to specify the weighted average function in equation 17.4. So those yellow guys are sort of unused, right? They're not, all, all you know are those three points. The, the, the indicator vectors, the characteristic vectors of these sort of singleton points on the hypercube. And because of that, therefore, we can look at the weighted average function as, you know, we've got the dot product, but it's basically just summing up x and the valuations. It's like an interpolation of those, of the valuations at those points on the hypercube. Right? We're taking a, value, a vector x and we're summing it up multiplying each element by whatever the weighted average function happens to be on those particular subset of the vertices of the hypercube, leaving all of these other vertices of the hypercube unused. Now, the function is linear in the weights, right? If we take two weight functions, w1 plus w2, and we define two weighted average functions based on the sum of the weights, it's linear in this, in this fashion, right? And it's also homogeneous, right? Because any alpha, it's um, alpha times x, the weighted average of alpha times x is equal to alpha times the weighted average for any, for any x, for, for any alpha and for any, for any x, of course, and for any w. Okay. Now, what if, it, on the other hand, we sort of define um, sort of maybe nonlinear aggregation functions? of the form um, that defining uh, sort of valuations on all of the points of the hypercube. So here what we did, let's just see if we can copy this, this figure over without copying a URL of some web page that I probably used months ago or days ago maybe. That worked. Okay, so there's the hypercube again. So now what we're going to do is we're going to um, <clears throat> we're going to actually utilize these points in yellow. Okay. If I can get rid of the yellow, I can't get rid of the yellow. Okay. So all of the points we're going to utilize, for example, this point here. is equal to the characteristic vector of E1, E2. And this point here is the characteristic vector of E2, E3. And this point here is the characteristic vector of E1, E2, E3. Right? We're going to use all of these points. Okay? 
And those, and those valuations, whatever they happen to be, are going to be given by the aggregation function, some sort of aggregation function whose values, the aggregation function is still going to be defined based on all the points of the vertices of the hypercube. And, and somehow we're going to come up with, and we're going to construct a, a, a generalized aggregation function of a particular x based on all of the points in the, all of the vertices of the hypercube rather than just the sort of singleton vert vertices, which were the ones that we saw before. And so here's our, here's what it might look like. So um, it's um, basically summing for all subsets of E, x of A times x of A. Now x of A is going to be still a, a modular function, but x of A, the modular function, is multiplied by W of A. Right, where W of A is basically equal to just the aggregation function evaluated on this particular char characteristic vector of A. Okay. Now, it, what 17.9 is saying is basically that, you know, obviously, we can, this is a strict generalization of what we said before. What we can do is we can always define all of these aggregation functions for non-singleton vertices of the hypercube to be zero, and we've not, we've not lost anything. We've only potentially gained something. Um, now, a little bit of notation. Um, this is essentially the basis for what the, the Sirkay integral is defined from. So we can, the, they use terminology like a, a function, a set discrete function is called a game. That's actually, this is actually something else we can, we could talk about in, in winters, some of the game theoretic applications of submodular, submodularity, which uh, we didn't get a chance to talk to this time. But basically, this function is called a game if, if it's normalized. So what we're calling a normalized submodular function is what Game theorists might call a game. And a set function is called capacity if it's monotone non-decreasing. So games are normalized, capacity is a monotone non-decreasing. Uh, we've got a Boolean function. So any Boolean function is a function from vertices of the hypercube to 0, 1, 0, 1. And any pseudo-Boolean Boolean function generalizes that so that we're still functions of vertices on the hypercube, but now what we are is uh, we're allowed to return a real value. And so therefore, any any um, submodular function is therefore a pseudo-Boolean function of a particular type, right? Um, any, func any set function, in fact, corresponds to a pseudo-Boolean function. And it should be clear that we can easily map back and forth between the vertices of the hypercube and the corresponding set for which that vertex is a characteristic vector of. All right, so that's basically what this is saying. Now, we saw this for the Lavoisier extension. Now, this whole idea was basically um, will give us the Lavoisier extension in terms of these aggregation functions. So here's, here's how we do it. So look, the Choquet integral was defined in this way, where basically we've got um, a capacity, which is not necessarily submodular, right? Because it's basically just saying it's a, it's a normalized monotone non-decreasing function because it's a game and a capacity. So we've got this capacity, and um, the Choquet integral for a particular capacity is defined in equation 17.10 which is exactly the same as the, Lava the general Lavoisier extension formula for, for an arbitrary submodular function, which we know, in, you know to be convex if it's the case that the, the function is itself, if a pseudo-Boolean function is itself also submodular. All right, so we have these two different forms. We saw this form, and then from the other form of the Lavoisier extension, we saw this. The only thing that's different here is that we're defining uh, a particular value, the last, um, the last value of the weight, we're just defining this to be zero. And we're also defining a particular set, E naught, to be empty. But if we, if we make these definitions of this zero element and the n plus first element, we get these very simple expressions, 17.10 and 17.11. Okay, and by the way, I should also mention in passing that the way, I mean, there's a generalized, I mentioned Abel's uh, different, different, uh, differentiation by parts in the discrete world. Uh, and there's a partial summation formula, which is 17.12, which is given below. And that essentially is the general form of why one can very easily go from 17.10 to 17.11. And it's pretty trivial to work this out, it's just algebra. But basically that, that, has, that is traditionally called Abel's summation or integration by parts. Um, now, the integral in the Chicoy integral, why is it called an integral? You know, we, we um, 
we like to think of integrals as the squiggly line, right? And, and the squiggly line is like an S. And I think I said in the slide a little while ago that the reason why it looks like an S is because it, you know, in, in, historically it comes from the notion of summation. It's a generalized form of summation. And so whenever you want to generalize the word summation, just start it with an integral sign, which is kind of like an S. Um, so here's how we can think of the Choquet integral as an integral. Um, so you can think of it as an integral over, over a piecewise constant function. It's a continuous integral over a function that's piecewise constant. So the first thing to note is that we're, we're again, in all of, these, all of this discussion, we're, we're renaming the elements so that we're sorting in descending order and we're defining this chain. So we, we have like probably, at this point, 50 slides with this bit on it. So just assume this is true. And okay, I'll probably say this another 50 times before the end of lecture, because uh, I like to remind people of this. <laughs> I don't know why. But anyway, this is all true, right? This is all assumptions. And, um, and then let's take a particular i, so a particular position within this ordered element, and then take a particular alpha between that guy so any alpha that's between WEI and WEI plus 1 is such that we can define EI, which is the, the chain element, the ith chain element, to be all E such that WE is greater than alpha. Right? This, is, this is exactly the same as defining it in this way here. All right. So in one case, we're saying it's all guys greater than the, all guys greater than the ith weight sorted in descending order. The other guy is saying it's all e is greater than some value alpha between the ith weight and the ith plus first weight. It's identical. But now what's nice is that we have this, this sort of level set like notation here, which is something that can be seen as a function of any real value, not just the values of these critical points in this sorted order of the weights. Right? So here's an example. So remember, we're sorting it in descending order. So W1 is the greatest. So assuming gr bigger is on the right, it's, it's a little bit maybe confusing, but this is the reason why I have these plus is WE1 is on the right. It's the biggest value. And WEM is on the left. It's the smallest value. Right? And we're not saying necessarily here whether W is positive or negative, so we don't know where zero, zero is. But these are these, these guys here. And, and we can choose an alpha, say, between here, and maybe alpha will be between there. And then basically we're choosing, if we, if we choose that as the alpha, then we're corresponding to, then we're unioning together um, all of these guys, which are bigger, right? So E4 plus E3 plus E2 plus E1, if we choose that alpha. Is everybody with me? Um, now, moreover, what we can do is, given our submodular function, we can come up with um, a function of alpha, which is defined on the ith segment. So this is, this is basically just something that says, when alpha is within this domain of this function, fi of alpha, where alpha, again, is in the domain of the function, is just defined to be the submodular function evaluated on the set corresponding to the E corresponding to this segment. Right? So again, just, just to make sure this is clear, like each one of these segments here corresponds to one set. Like this is one set, and then this is another set, and this is another set, and so on and so forth. Okay? Each one of these corresponds to a different set. And so we take a particular alpha, and then we just evaluate f at that particular set. And that set happens to correspond to f of e, right? f of ei, that is. Now let's just group these functions together. So for any alpha, so let's, let's just use case, the case structure, where basically, um, and actually we don't even need to restrict it to be between 0 and 1. So let's just get rid of this. Let's just say if alpha is less than wm, which is the smallest value, we're just going to evaluate at f of e, OK? And then if alpha is between one of those segments, we give the submodular function <coughs> evaluation there. And then if alpha is greater than W1, which is the largest value, we just give it a valuation of 0. And so here's this piecewise constant function, which we've defined. All 
And this, this goes on. Because we're saying it, it actually defines, it can, it can work for values of alpha less than zero as well. We just stay at f of e. Okay? So the question at the bottom is what's depicted as a game. Um, well, actually, is it a game? Well, we don't really know, do we? Because we're not evaluating it on the empty set. I mean, I, I guess if we define this to be, if we define this to be f of the empty set, would it be a game? Remember, game is just normalized if the empty set is zero. Yes, no, game? Let's play a game. It's a game. Okay, it is a game, uh, but, it, but it's not a capacity. So why is it not a capacity? It's going up and down. It's going up and down, exactly. Okay, so now, but now what we've done is we've taken for this particular chain the valuations of this discrete function, which clearly is not a capacity, but it could be a capacity if it was monotone, right? If it was monotone um, decreasing right here, because, because basically the, for the function to be a capacity, it has to be going down, right? Um, because the sets are getting smaller as we move to the right. Um, but whatever the function is, we can actually define an integral. We can integrate over alpha now. Uh, let's just consider the case when we're integrating, integrating from zero to infinity, but we can extend that. We will extend that for values other than uh, zero. But we can integrate over the whole function, f of alpha. And let's, let's, make, let's assume that it is a game. So we're normalizing it. Right? And also recall that we're assuming that there's this extra element, wn plus one, which is just defined to be zero. Okay? So that's not really in the vector w, but it, just for indexing purposes and for uniformity of notational summation, of the summation notation, let's just define that. And so this integral basically has the following form. So we integrate from zero to infinity of the function of alpha, which in 17.15 we plug in the definition, which basically says that, well, since zero is equal to wm plus one, we can just sub wm plus one in there. And now we can sort of think about the integration in each one of these segments. Right, since we only need to sum each segment's a di distinct integral, the points on the boundary don't matter because they have zero measure. And once we integrate in each of those segments, we plug in the value. But here's, here's where it's kind of cool. So it's like a, integrating a constant function within the value. And so using just the regular integration, we get the function value times the difference, wi minus wi plus one. Now that suddenly looks a lot like the Lavoisier extension, doesn't it? So the integral is, is the Lavoisier extension, or the Choquet integral. Lavoisier extension. So the definition, or pro whatever you want to call it, basically the Lavoisier extension, or equivalent of the Choquet integral, that may be defined in this fashion where it's an integral over f of alpha, where f of alpha is defined in the following way. Okay. Um, now this is in the case when we're defining it between zero and infinity. Um, it's in general not necessarily to require um, um, w to be positive. Here we, we made some special cases, even the picture assumed that it was zero uh, for alpha less than zero. I extended it. Uh, before, uh, uh, we'll see a slightly more generalization, a slightly more general definition of equation 19 in one second. But let's get back to the notion of aggregation. So um, this generalized aggregation, we're claiming the, that the Lavoisier extension is, is, of, is of this form, okay, of equation 17.20. This is the generalized aggregation of all points on the hypercube. So how is it the case? So what we're going to do is the following. We're going to take the hypercube and we're going to petition it into um, uh, simplices. I mean, more, more, most generally, we're going to partition it into polytopes. So any, any, for example, here's where my picture drawing skills are going to fail me. So if it's, we're in two dimensions, we can partition this into two simplices, right? We've got a yellow simplex and maybe the cyan 
or whatever color that is, simplex. Per, uh, what is that color? I don't know, magenta. I never, like, this is the color that I, that I never know what to call it. But anyway, that, those two colors. And in, in three dimensions, um, you can imagine, uh, it's, hard, it's very hard to draw, but you can imagine, say, taking this and maybe this. And if you could imagine this volume filling in, that would be one triangle. Or any, any actual polytope, you can essentially partition into a set of polytopes. And so each of the polytopes, obviously, is, poly, is going to be polyhedral. And let's say that each one of these polytopes um, can be defined based on essentially a set of vertices, uh, which are subsets of the vertices of, of the hypercube itself. Right? So you take any subset of the vertices and you get a polytope. Right? by taking the convex hull of that set of vertices. The polytopes themselves constitute a partitioning of the hypercube, but the set of vertices are, of course, not going to be, because you're going to reuse a vertex in multiple polytopes. So in some sense, this is like a triangulation. Like If, it, if, if these are triangles, then th this is a triangulation of the hypercube. And also, let's just define a notation that says v of x is um, the particular polytope. Is a, let's just assign a polytope where x lives. And it's not going to be necessarily be unique, because when we you know, partition, even in the case of two dimensions, if we take a point right on this boundary, that guy might live in both. But let's just arbitrarily, in those cases, assign a unique um, polytope for every x. And let's just call that v of x. Okay, so for any x, oops, for any x in the convex hull of the corresponding polytope, v of x is where it lives. Yep. Uh, in this slide, A1, A2, A3 are individual vertices. They're not sets. Those are the vertices of the of the hypercube, right? Because any vertex of the hypercube corresponds to a subset of of the ground set. No. They're not of size one. They're all, they're they're um, basically any polytope. We're, we're defining. We're saying that any polytope corresponds to a set of these vertices <coughs> of the hypercube. Okay. So getting back to this figure here, this wonderful figure here. <laughs> the um, let's zoom in a little bit so you can see this wonderful figure better. So we're, if we take this vertex, this vertex, this vertex, and this vertex, and so. So the, the skeletal edges of that polytope would be this. One more, right? Does that make sense? So that's, that's one triangle. And then we partition the whole hypercube using these triangles. And then each one of these, you know, these guys here are like one sub AI. So this is, you know, that, it's the characteristic vector of some set. Okay, so most generally, let's say that, that for every, um, we're going to define an aggregation function where for every um, vertex here, this is, this is 1 sub a in v of x. Okay, so 1a, for all a such that 1 of a lives in v of x, we need essentially some linear combination of the coefficients, actually affine combination of the coefficients of x. And so the most general sort of form of affine combination is going to be this form. It's going to be a single real number, which is just some affine function. Notice that it's a function, each of these affine coefficients are going to be a function of x itself and a function of a, right? Now, of course, a lot of them might be zero, they might be positive and negative, but basically this is essentially the most general affine combination. This is an affine combination. So for every vertex of the block of the partition for which, within which x lives has one of these affine transformations of x. Okay. I think that I said that correctly. Now, with this, we can define an aggregation function this way. Right. 
So the aggregation function of x is basically summing over all a, such that the characteristic vectors is equal to the, um, is, is contained within this list of vertices of the hypercube that, are, that constitute the polytope within which x lives. And for all such sets, we take whatever the aggregation function evaluation is at one sub a, multiplied by whatever this affine transformation of the coefficients of x are. So this is, in some sense, a very, very general form. And we're claiming that this is also the Lavoisier extension, or this corresponds to the Lavoisier extension. How? Well, here's how. So let's partition the hypercube based on triangular simplices. Um, so we, let's, let's use m, let's say we're in m dimensions, and so let's use m factorial blocks, so a partition with m factorial blocks, which are, these are called the canonical partitions of the hypercube, and these are the triangles, right? These are the triangles corresponding to all orders. Now, again, in two dimensions, this is E1 and this is E2, there's only two orders, right? There's this guy where here on the bottom where W uh, E1 E1 is greater than W E2 and this guy up here where W E1 is less than W E2. Right. So there's only two in, when you're in two dimensions but in general when you're in n dimensions we've got essentially um, all of these guys all m factorial of the guys are these defined based on an, all of the m factorial orderings of of x, okay? And so for each one of these guys, um, <coughs> when we have these being the corresponding um, vertices of the hypercube that give us one of these triangles, that precisely corresponds to the vertices when we sort any x that lives within that block in descending order. All right, so going back to this guy, so that what vertices would we take to get the bottom block? Let's, let's, so we take this guy here, and this guy, and this guy. We get those three vertices. And we get that, those vertices, you know, any, we choose any particular x inside of here. Let's say that the red guy is x. And then we sort x in descending order, and we get those green vertices. If, on the other hand, let's use um, magenta as an x, if we sort that x, we're going to get the gray vertices. And that will give us that polytope. And this is true in general in n dimensions. And so we can get these vertices, and when we do that, we essentially get that this corresponding affine transformation, if we want the Lavoisier extension, we just set this to be equal to the difference, right, in, of, of the corresponding x in the ith position. Okay, so then, just to ask you, so then the aggregation of one sub a in such case, for this to correspond to the Lavoisier extension, what would that need to be? that is equal to f of a. So therefore, we're just essentially defining the aggregation function to be whatever that submodular function is, or whatever the discrete set function is, defined at the sets corresponding to the vertices of the corresponding characteristic vector. And we, and we see this, as, again, it's an aggregation function, a generalized aggregation function. Now, the original aggregation function, when we just define it on the singleton sets, that's also going to be linear. That's also going to be linear on the um, in x, right? So if we take the weighted average of x1 plus the weighted, a weighted average of x1 plus x2, that's going to be the weighted average of x1 plus the weighted average of x2. So that, that guy's both linear in the weights and linear in x, but th here what's important is that it's linear in x, right? It's linear in x. In this particular case, in this generalized case, it's no longer linear in x, right? But you can also, but it is linear in the submodular function. If you have two submodular functions that are 
and you sum them together, we're sort of linear in that. And that actually turns out to be a property of the submodular or the Lavoisier extension, which we'll see. So therefore, we can think of the Lavoisier extension as a generalized nonlinear aggregation function. Okay. Um, there's one other form I thought was interesting. You can actually, this, this is pretty clear given the definitions, but basically you can define the Lavoisier extension as W transpose times C sigma, where sigma is, we're taking the max of C sigma over all m factorial permutations, and where C sigma is basically defined to be the difference of the submodular function. Okay. So it's like a max over, perm over, over n factorial number of permutations of a particular vector that's defined for that permutation. And the reason why we get that is, again, for the, from this formula here, because we're taking the max. I mean, the Lavoisier extension in 17.26 is the max over, over the base, right? And, um, and the base is where we're take, we're, we have all n factorial possible vertices of the base in, in the most general case. And the greedy algorithm, which solves this, essentially gives us one of the vertices. And um, therefore, it's the max overall permutations. And th this is just the greedy algorithm. So this is just a, basically what we've seen in disguise. Slight, slight bit of disguise. It, it's, it's got, it's, this is like 17 to 24 is like the Lavoisier extension with one of those long nose covers on. You guys, <laughs> that, so that was a joke. And this is, this is not, uh, that was not funny, I guess. OK, so. Um, OK, so here's um, uh, a, m a slightly more general way of defining Lavoisier extensions. What I want to try to do before we get to break is, is finish this section, the Lavoisier extension definitions and properties, because uh, that's sort of very logical. And then we can sort of break and then get onto context minimization and submodular function minimization. So are there any, are there any questions? So we're going to use this as shorthand notation. So w greater than or equal to alpha is just going to be equal to this, this guy here. And this is called the, the weak alpha soup level set of w. So a level set would be where, um, I mean, it's, it's got all these words. It's weak. What are all these words come from? Weak, um, soup, level. Alpha of <laughs> sorry of is not so why are all these words there? Well, it's weak because we're using an inequality, right? We're greater than or equal to rather than great strictly greater than. It's a level. It's a soup level. It's, it's we're using soup because it's above the level set. Level would be if we were to use equal, and soup level means we use greater or greater than or equal, and it's alpha because of alpha, and level when because we think we're generalizing it in a level set in, in convex analysis. And so, obviously, this would then correspond to the strong alpha soup level set of W. Okay, so this is a shorthand notation that folks use. And by the way, this is, if you read, for example, like Francis Bach's book, he uses this notation copiously. Um, so if we take any W, again, we're sorting this. We've said this before in descending order. Um, right, so now we're going to sort of just, since we're talking one particular ordering, we're just going to number, we're going to renumber the elements of W so that they're in decreasing order. So I don't have to keep typing W of E1 and W E2. I'm just going to call it, say, W E1, which is the biggest guy, and then W E N, which is the smallest guy. I'm going to say W M, which is a further shortcut. And then, then we have the Lavoisier extension. Uh, which we said can work for any function which is not even submodular. Um, but there are a lot of other ways in, in general where we can define the Lavoisier extension. So we have, we saw this is the Lavoisier extension, we can define it this way, basically as a sum of weighted submodular gains, or we can define it as a sum of weighted submodular evaluations, or via a Bell summation, we can define it this way, or in this sort of more general integral form. We can define it here, 
in this integral form. So remember, before we said that we can define it as the integral between zero and infinity, but now we're defining it as between the minimum of weight and infinity. Um, but we can also define it um, in this fashion here. So what we want to do is quickly go through why this is possible. Um, so uh, I guess, sorry, there's one last form where we can define it as the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of f hat, where f hat is basically just this case function, which is this way. And so again, we're defining, we're using the submodular function, but we're defining the submodular function on the soup level sets of alpha, according to W. So it's a very shorthand notation, but thanks to this notation of equation 17.34 and these other guys here, it will be possible to see certain properties of the Lavoisier extension very, very simply and clearly. So why do we like integrals? Because we can use our intuition and just sort of immediately see results that we know to be true about integrals. Since in this particular case, when we have f hat alpha, we just, it's just basically some function of alpha. Okay. But of course, the function of alpha changes as w changes. So this is only for one particular w. So how do we show this? So we're going to do. We're going to so show that 17.32. So what is 17.32 again? So we're going to show 17.32, which is the blue guy. So let me just give you a second to digest 17.32. It's the sum of two terms, the integral from the min to infinity of the superlevel sets of the fu sublogic function plus f of the ground set times the min weight. So first of all, we can see that by looking at the min weight is just equal to WEM, right? Um, and then we're going to consider this function. This is sort of the same generalization that we saw before from a couple of slides ago, except that we're using a submodular function here. And it's this piecewise constant function, which we had a plot of from a few slides ago. And here we're also using strictly open intervals Right. Um, all the intervals are open, and the reason why is because when we're doing an integration, we don't care about what happens at the boundary since they occur on a set on sets of measure zero. So that doesn't change the integration results. So inside the integral, this uh, covers this gives us seventeen point three one, which is basically what we saw before. 17.31 is the yellow bit, where we're basically, we saw before where we're taking that integral, and we get the, f the, when we do the integral for each one of these piecewise constant segments, we get the, the value on the piecewise constant segment plus the length of the segment. Okay. Oops. Now, what we want to do is we want to show 17.33, which is this guy, seven at the bottom. And we want to start with 17.32 and show that we can derive 17.33. Okay, and then that 17.33 immediately gives us this form here, right? So Wm is equal to the min, and let's take any beta. This is a little bit tricky, but hopefully this will be clear. So we take any beta which is less than the minimum weight in zero. So that means that beta can't be greater than zero. And um, this, is, this equation here is 17.33, right? which we can write in this, in this way here. right? So, I mean, what in some sense is happening, let me just, if this isn't clear, um, <clears throat> here's a line, and here's um, Wm, and here's beta, say. So this first bit here is basically integrating from Wm to infinity. Okay. Um, this next integral here is just integrating from beta to Wm, 
And then this last guy here is integrating over here. So the red subtract to the red minus green is equal to yellow. Okay. And all this other stuff, this is this should be the orange stuff is should be pretty clear. That's equal. So how do you like color and pictures? Now you can see which part of the equation corresponds to which part of the picture. Uh, does everybody see that? Can you see the colors? Okay, good. So, um, so we've got that guy. Now, um, the next thing that we're going to do is um, just note that um, for any for any such value of this integral between um, this guy here, the value, the thing that we're integrating, f of w greater than alpha, um, or f, the level set of w greater than the alpha, for such, for such small alpha is going to be e. Right? So we just define the function to be this thing. So, that, so that's the only difference that we're making in this particular form. Okay. Okay, so then once we've got that, we have um, the following. That we can integrate, since beta is less than or equal to zero, let's break this guy into two pieces, into this one plus this one. Okay, so rather than integrating from beta to infinity, let's integrate from beta to zero and then from zero to infinity. Okay. And then secondly, let's take these two guys. We're integrating from beta to, we're subtracting beta, the integral from beta to Wm and then adding zero to Wm. So that again, we can sort of look at on the number line and we've got beta here and maybe Wm here. So what we're doing here, let's just erase this red part. And then zero is somewhere over here. So we're adding this bit here. We're subtracting the green bit, which is beta to Wm. And so what we're left with is <coughs> this yellow bit, beta to zero. <coughs> so everything corresponds, right? And so then what we get is um, something where these two integrals correspond. We can combine them together here, and that gives us 17.33. So this last thing is 17.33. So it's basically just, just an integral. So when we define f hat, then we got that integral of a function. Okay, so now, based on this, we can actually define a number of properties, very simply, of the submodular function. So first of all, let's say that f, of f and g are normalized functions. Okay. Now, this is not necessarily, sorry, what I said was that f and g, are sub, f and g need not be submodular. f and g are just two, are just two normalized discrete set functions. Um, and we have this Lavoisier extension operator. So given f and g with Lavoisier extensions f tilde a and g tilde, then we can add the Lavoisier extensions, and that corresponds to the Lavoisier extension of f plus g. Okay. And moreover, lambda f tilde is the Lavoisier extension of lambda times f. Okay. Um, secondly, if w is in the positive orthant, then we, the Lavoisier extension is, as we said from a few slides ago, the in integral from zero to infinity of the level sets of f. This one's a really interesting one to sort of understand the shape of the Lavoisier extension. It's basically saying that if we take the Lavoisier extension of w and we add something that moves in the sort of direction of 1e, the characteristic vector of e. So what is the characteristic vector of e? That's basically a, a, a direction that's moving away from the origin. Right? So we, let's say you know, this, is, this is this direction 1 of e where this is E1 and E2. This is in two dimensions. 
So basically, that's the same as taking the Lavoisier extension of whatever the W is <coughs> and adding alpha times f of e. So it's basically it scales linearly. Nothing, nothing really on on that on that line. Nothing fancy happens. It just scales linearly with alpha, or just additively. It's an additive constant which is linear in alpha. So there's no kinks or anything that happens there. We also have positive homogeneity. So if we evaluate f of Lavoisier extension of f of alpha, where alpha is a non-negative number, then we get alpha times the Lavoisier extension. Now it's not negatively homogeneous, and why is that? If, we, if alpha was negative, it would change the order, or it would completely change the valuations of the submodular function. So it has to be non-negative. Or, right? Order is the same. If it's the case that it's a zero, then the or, you know, obviously all orders are the same, but we just get a zero valuation. Um, we have tightness at the vertices of the hypercube. Um, and that if the function is symmetric in this way, so remember from early on in this class, we talked about symmetric submodular functions corresponds to sort of combinatorial mutual information. And so any sort of combinatorial mutual information function is such that its Lavoisier extension is sort of even symmetric, namely f of tilde, f tilde of w is equal to f tilde of negative tilde. So it's the same in this even bit around the, the origin. And this last bit is a partitioning thing, which I'm going to skip. But basically, it turns out that if it's the case that um, <coughs> you define a vector, which is, in some sense, piecewise constant on w, I'm not going to go into great detail on this, you can actually sort the coefficients of, of, of that sort of piecewise con composed w and define the Lavoisier extension based on the gains of these blocks of the submodular function rather than the individual gains. And the reason why, I mean, you can sort of see this because the, every, within the blocks, basically all these differences cancel out. Okay. Because of the zeros. Yep. Uh, can something be said about F in the context of this first point? So can something be said about what? Uh, we are talking about F plus G. Can something basically a product of uh, F and G? A product of F and G? Um, no. The product of f and g might, might, there's nothing we can say about f times g. In general, if you take a um, product of two submodular functions, you don't, you don't necessarily preserve submodularity. But in, in here, if you take the product, we're here, here we're talking about things that are not necessarily submodular. Um, of course, if, if the Lavoisier extension is convex, if all of these things are convex, this is true for, the, then, then of course this is submodular. So, so if, if in, in addition we said and f and g are, con if the extensions are convex, then that insists that f and g are both submodular. So the reason why we care about this, as we will see, maybe today's lecture, is that you know, when we want to sort of get an intuition about what the Lavoisier extension tells us for several reasons. One, because we're interested in using it for submodular function minimization, as we'll see. But also because as a, a really important application right now in machine learning, I think, is to use them as, as structured convex norms for a machine learning problem. Um, so what, the, what we're doing here is gaining some intuition, some properties of Lavoisier extension, so that maybe we can sort of design the norm and look at what the norm, look at the properties. Like, for example, this one, property three, says that f tilde of w plus alpha times one e is equal to this constant times the original Lavoisier extension. So this basically says that um, the Lavoisier extension scales linearly as we move along this line. So here we are in 2D again, and we're moving along this line here. Then basically the Lavoisier extension along this line scales linear on the red line. And moreover, interestingly enough, if the function is, is normalized in this fashion, so that f of e is also equal to zero, then as we move along this line, this red line, the Lavoisier extension doesn't change. It's just constant. So thanks to these um, 
the, the integral definitions, remember what is 17.30 through 17.33? So here they are, it's this nice colorful slide. So thanks to these definitions, which we now know to be true, most of the properties of the Voss extension are very easy to derive. And I, I think I'm gonna skip, uh, like, th skip this one, but here's like, for example, the, um, the property of, of even symmetric. It basically just uses um, the integral properties and it uses the fact that um, the submodular function is also symmetric. So maybe you can look at that offline. Um, another important interpretation of the Lavasse extension is as the expected value of a random variable. And this is actually very useful for deriving randomized results associated with randomized al rounding algorithms. Because a, a lot of problems that, um, that involve submodular function, constrained submodular function optimization do the following. If you've got a submodular function, you can relax it to a convex function via the Lavasse extension, which we know to be very easy to evaluate thanks to the, the greedy algorithm, the Edmonds greedy algorithm. So now we've got a convex function, which is a relaxed form of the submodular function. Now let's say that we're interested in minimizing a submodular function subject to a particular constraint. Like let's say it's a tree constraint or a cut constraint or some other form of constraint, some combinatorial constraint. So most of these constraints have polytopes associated with them. Like we could take the convex hull of the indicator of the characteristic vectors of the sets that satisfy the constraint. Like there's something called a cut polytope or there's something, there's tree polytopes or path polytopes. Um, so then when we take the convex hull, we get a convex region. And when we relax the submodular function, we get a submodular function. So what we've done is now turned, we've relaxed the function, a, a discrete function, a discrete optimization problem into a continuous one, which is a convex optimization pro problem, thanks to the convexity of, this, of the Lavasse extension. And then what you do, you, now you've got this continuous solution. When you're done, then you have to round it somehow. And so this next result is actually useful for proving results about rounding. And so, um, so we have this integral, right? The Lavasse extension is an integral. And when we take, um, since, since we're assuming that, um, since we've defined, defined this function basically for any, um, for any um, alpha greater than W1, which is the biggest possible value, we get the empty set, right? And so well, that's equal to zero so that the integral might as well be written in this, in this fashion, okay? And so therefore, if we take a W which is inside, which is a member of the, of the hypercube, so therefore W is, all, is, is always positive, we can write the integral in this way. So we don't need to integrate um, to W1, we can integrate all the way to one. So it's the integral from zero to one of this thing. And the reason why is because of the evaluation for all values of alpha greater than W1 are gonna be zero. So now let's consider alpha to be a uni uniformly distributed random variable between zero and one. Okay, so it has a uniform distribution between zero and one. And let's say that alpha is any function of alpha. So then H is any function of alpha. And so how do we take the expected value of H well, the expected value of H, according to that uniformly distributed random variable, is just basically the integral, right? So that therefore means that the Lavasse extension is the integral. Here's the Lavasse extension is equal to the integral of that guy, which is equal to the expected value according to this uniformly distributed random variable, right? And so therefore the Lavasse extension can be seen as an expected value under a uniform random variable between zero and one. So this is a very useful property because now you can start taking things like looking at various different bounds associated with means of random variables associated and, and looking at the randomness and coming up with, uh, with um, sort of combinatorial probabilistic arguments for why rounding algorithms work. Where's the 
the random variable comes from the fact that alpha is a uniform distribution distributed between zero and one, right? Oh. Right. You got it? Okay. Good question. Um, but yeah, so so alpha is uniformly distributed. So it's basically maybe I can um, maybe this this will also help if I write this as it's p sub alpha. And so, so alpha is now uniformly distributed according to p sub alpha. Does that help a little bit? Okay. No, p sub alpha. So h of alpha is the function. So this is, um, I'll do this in red. So h of alpha is this guy. Oops, what's going on here? Here's h of alpha. This whole thing here is h of alpha, right? Which is equal to the integral of piece of alpha, h of alpha, d alpha, expected value of alpha of h, right? Okay. So. What we're going to see, we're going to revisit this again. Um, we're going to see, from the perspective of defining a norm, one other result, which we're not going to get to today, but the, we will get to it on, on Monday. Well, so Mondays, like I said, if you're really interested in, in convex structured norms, make sure you come to Monday's lecture, because it will be very important. But what we're going to see is that the Lavasse extension is also the convex envelope of um, the submodular function evaluated on the support of a particular vector w. Um, and we're going to we'll prove that on Monday. But um, for right now, I want to take a break because I want to talk a little bit more about convex minimization and submodular function minimization and then get to some more examples of the Lavasse extension. So let's uh, pause and uh, come back in a few minutes. OK, so um, I just want to briefly mention the ellipsoid algorithm and just some properties about it, um, because this was essentially the method that people first, for the first time, proved that it was possible to minimize submodular functions in polynomial time. And this was a huge problem, because in the 1970s, and this is, this is what I surmise from having read the literature in the 1970s, that you know, the, the theory of NP-completeness was you know, developed in, the 19, in 1970. I mean, in fact, I, I think I've mentioned this before, but in, in, in the 1965, this paper, also by Jack Edmonds, called Path, Trees, and Flowers, sort of defined the whole theory of NP-completeness. And then two classic papers by uh, Cook and, and Richard Karp in 1970 came out, like the irreducibility of the, 20, the, the 21 first reducibility problems that were all sort of seen within, within, to be in, in the class. Um, NP and reducible to each other, um, polynomial time. Um, and so there's this explosion of interest in the theory of NP completeness and what problems were NP complete, what problems were exponential, what problems were polynomial time. And submodular functions, there was a great interest in that and a lot of people were, were thinking about them and trying to show whether or not no one was able to prove that submodular function minimization was NP complete. But at the same time, also nobody was able to prove that there was a polynomial time algorithm for it. So um, this was finally solved using the ellipsoid algorithm. And it used, uh, it used greedy, Edmonds' greedy algorithm for help. So here's, here's just the basics. We're not going to really get into any of the details of this, but here's the basic idea. So let's say that C is any non-empty convex compact set, which could, could be our submodular polytope. But let's say, in this case, C is any convex set. And so what the ellipsoid algorithm rests on is the, the, the polynomial time reducibility of, of optimization problems and separation problems. And so the optimization problem is very similar to what we've seen, which is that we've got some C and, and we want to find a vector x, which is in the convex set that maximizes the dot product on C. In other words, we want to, we want to solve this problem. Okay, now, C could be any convex set. C might be specifiable with an exponential number of constraints or something. So C could be very, very complicated. Even though it's convex, that doesn't mean that it's um, you know, efficiently solvable. It might be exponential in the number of inequalities. And we saw that the submodular polytope was one that does, in fact, have an exponential number of facets. 
So we can't just naively do convex minimization without actually knowing the structure of this polytope because that would take forever, or that would take you know, a long time, <laughs> which is forever. Uh, now there's something called the separation problem, which basically says, which asks if you, you know, you're, you're given a vector y and you want to decide if y is a member of C, and if it's not, so let's say that here's, here's say C here, and here's y, and if, if y is, is not a member of C, <coughs> defining some, some sort of like maybe supporting hyperplane which separates y and C, or actually any hyperplane. So any hyperplane that separates y and here's C over here. It's not a very good picture, but you get the idea. So it turns out that the separation problem and the optimization problem are polynomial time reducible to each other. And so this was shown in 1981. So it said basically, um, the same Lavas that the Lavas extension was named after, by the way, uh, that uh, C is a set of convex sets. Uh, and then the theorem states that there's a polynomial time algorithm to solve the separation problem for the members of C, if and only if there's a polynomial time algorithm to solve the optimization problem for the members of C. So these guys are polynomial time identical in terms of their difficulty. They're polynomial time reducible to each other. And since we saw that um, the greedy algorithm Typo, sorry. The greedy algorithm solves the optimization problem for submodular polytopes. Um, then, therefore, we can solve the optimization problem. And so, the ellipsoid algorithm, the basic idea of the algorithm, I mean, this is just a horrendous cartoon description of the algorithm. It's like we have some, some polytope here. And what we do is we surround it with an ellipse. And we want to see whether a particular point is in the polytope. And we just keep dividing the, the ellipse into smaller and smaller pieces until we can decide it. And it turns out that the ellipses are decreasing in, in volume exponentially. And uh, it turns out that doing these ellipsoidal equations is polynomial time. And uh, you can show that it, it decreases exponentially and converges very fast and gives us a polynomial time algorithm for, for these kinds of problems. Um, the, unfortunately, and, and this is, it turns out, thanks to this equivalence, th and also thanks to Edmonds's greedy algorithm, which, which solves the optimization problem in polynomial time, shows that we can solve polynomial, some function minimization in polynomial time. Now, it turns out, however, that the ellipsoidal algorithm is, you know, I've never implemented it myself, but it's not practical. Even at in, in the 1980s, early 80s, people knew that it was not practical because of the computational difficulties of the numerics involved and also the, um, the um, you know the, the high order polynomial time uh, ness of the algorithm. Although to be honest, actually, I mean, I, I wonder. I just I'm just thinking about this now. But like, given the recent interest and and capabilities of deep models, deep models are also training deep models are also very very computationally difficult. And that maybe if people would go back and look at the ellipsoid algorithm and implement them on GPUs, maybe actually it would become reasonable and practical. I don't know, because there is now available. And the, the kinds of operations that you need to use on ellipses are also matrix-like operations. And so maybe they're, thanks to the gaming industry, the ellipsoidal algorithm is suddenly more practical. So um, there's, a, there's a book on this topic, which I think is a really, really nice book. Even it, it has a, several chapters on, on just on computational geometry, which are really, really nice. They talk about various different properties of sort of computational geometric objects and norms and convexity and incompleteness and all of the things sort of built all in one, in one place. It's a really nice book, um, which is underread, I think, especially in the machine learning community. But, um, okay, so the sub, sub modular function minimization is also related to the convexity of the Lavas extension. Now, um, and the reason why is because of the relative ease of minimizing convex functions exactly relative to say, non-convex functions. And so, like, for example, we do have that the Lavas, when this function is submodular, the Lavas extension is easy to evaluate. And because of its form, it's tight at the hyper edges, at the hyper, at the hyper vertices, the vertices of the hypercube. And we can then minimize the Lavas extension. And then we get something which isn't necessarily a vertex. Right, because it's, it's a convex function, it's extension. We might get some point, which is a real value. Now it turns out that can we round? Um, what's the integrality gap? Is there an integrality gap? 
Um, I mean, if it's a convex function, when you minimize it, it's, it, it could, it, like, for example, if, if we remember we, that we had this picture, it might very well be that it looks like this. So if we minimize the submodular, the Lavoisier extension, we can get that, which is not a solution. Or it could be, we could be very lucky, and maybe it looks like that. So that if we minimize the convex extension, we still get something which is the same solution. And in general, when it's a hypercube, we might get um, sort of a polytope within which all of the solutions are the same, right? So, you, so whenever you minimize a convex function, the set of minima of the convex function correspond to a convex region. So in end, like, let's just draw this as a cube here. So it might be the case that the minimum of this convex function corresponds to this whole plane down at the bottom. But still, once, you know, we don't know that. We don't know what, what, what category the Lavoisier extension is in. Is it in this category? So that if we minimize it, we get a lower bound? Or, if, or it looks more like this, where if we minimize it, we get the solution to the submodular function minimization. And moreover, if we do get a solution, like let's say we get a solution corresponding to this black point right here, is that something that's easily roundable to the discrete solutions? Because since, since it's a discrete optimization problem, we want to get the discrete solutions, or a, at least one of them. Um, so what we have is the following theorem, that in fact, the situation we're in is not this situation. Namely, let's say that you have a submodular function and f tilde it's Lavoisier extension. Then if we minimize the submodular function, this is a critically important theorem, so if you haven't been paying attention, pay attention now. If we minimize the submodular function, that's identical to minimizing the Lavoisier extension on the vertices, which, which is obvious, right? We know that now because the vertices, we get the same value. But the real theorem to prove is this next bit, which is the same that if we minimize the Lavoisier extension on the entire, within the entire polytope within the entire hypercube, okay? So this is the theorem to prove, right? Critical one. And so how do we prove this? Well, first of all, we, we have, th it should be very clear that, that this first bit is true, right? Because we've now shown that even when the function is not submodular, we have the valuations on the vertices of the hypercube being exact. Okay, so that basically corresponds to this. And then, um, because we're expanding the set over which we're considering the minimization, um, minimizing over the entire hypercube can only be less, right? Because we're including the vertices in, our, in, our, in, the, in the feasible set, as well as all of the interior points. So that basically corresponds to this picture here, the one I just crossed out. Um, now let's consider any W, okay? W or any W which is um, in the hypercube and we're gonna sort, decrease, and define the chain as we've been doing. So this is this stuff that we've now repeated probably 100 times in today's lecture. Um, and also this we've repeated, so we know this. So this is all boilerplate stuff at this point. Um, and the other thing to note is that because we're choosing the W inside of the hypercube, we have the, that the, sub, the sum of the lambdas is going to be less than one, and in particular is equal to, is equal to W of E1. Okay. Right, because all the other guys are going are to cancel out. And W E1 is going to be the greatest one here, but it's also going to be less than or equal to one because we're choosing points inside of the hypercube. Now, we're assuming, this is, this is a really critical to, to recall. So we're assuming that f of the empty set is equal to zero. So that basically means that when we do this minimization problem, the minimum valuation of the submodular function is either gonna be negative or zero. So no positive value, we just know a priori that this is the case. And remember, we don't lose any generality by making this assumption of zero. We can always sort of subtract off the value at zero and we don't really destroy anything. All of the things that we want the same. So this therefore means that we've got the following. So that if we take the Lavoisier extension and we're going to use this integral form, 
from 0 to 1. And then here's the, the weighted function evaluation form. Um, so each one of these, these guys here, each one of these guys here is um, going to be lower bounded by whatever the true minimum is. And so therefore that's going to be less than or equal to this. But that's going to be greater than or equal to the minimum value of the submodular function. Why is that? And that again follows because the sum over i of lambda of i is less than or equal to 1. Right? If the sum of i happens to be equal to 1, then the last thing, this guy here, is going to be just an equality. And if it's less than or equal to 1, it's an inequality, again, because of the negativity of the minimum of the submodular function. Does everybody see that? OK. Yep. Which, which, which one? Which, which inequality? Yeah, this is the critical thing. So that's why I'm pointing this out. So we're assuming that this is true, right? And so therefore the true minimum is negative, right? So that means that this guy here is less than or equal to zero. And then if we multiply it by itself, so here's zero down here. And here's whatever this minimum is. And if we multiply this here, which is m times lambda times alpha. So we're going to make alpha, we're going to make m bigger because alpha is going to be between 0 and 1. Because remember, m is negative. And that gives us, this, this is always the confusing bit of this. Um, it gives us this inequality. Let's call this guy a. Okay, so therefore, what this means is that the, sub, the Lavoisier extension, minimizing the Lavoisier extension, gives us exactly the value that we want, namely the minimum of the submodular function. Right. So basically, getting back to this picture, it means, like I said, we're not in this category. Right. The the situation actually looks more like this. Right. which is great. On the other hand, once we've got this minimum solution, how do we know? So what, what, another way of saying this is that this says that, that the integrality gap is 1 of the relaxation and the discrete function. Um, on the other hand, once we've got a continuous solution, how do we get back the discrete solution? So that's the other thing. Um, so let's say that w star is the minimum of the Lavoisier extension. And let's say that a star is one of the minima of the submodular function. So we've got these two guys, w star and a star. We know that their value, the valuations of the submodular function on a star and the valuations of the Lavoisier extension on w star are the same. But the question is, can we get the, minima, the minimizers, the discrete minimizers? So we've got these, these things are the same, but can we get the discrete minimizers? Uh, it turns out that we can, and, and moreover, not only can we do that, but it's really easy. So we start from w, and we can actually define lambda i star, which are uh, the weights of the Lavoisier extension evaluated at w star. So we're defining lambda i star exactly identically as we've done in previous slides. Okay. And that means that the Lavoisier extension evaluated at the optimal solution is just equal to this, right? because that's just the definition of the Lavoisier extension. Which we know is equal to f of a star, which is the true minimum, which is that. Okay. Um, moreover, we have the following: we have that um, each one of these eis, so the eis here, are defined. Those are the sets. Those are the chain, chain sets corresponding to the ordering of w, uh, w star, which is the true minimum. Right, so, it's any w, we can define a chain. We can define a chain based on. Uh, the minimum of the Lavoisier extension, and that's what we're doing in E i star. But on the other hand, because f of a star is the minimum, we have this inequality, right? F evaluated each one of these guys. 
And, and the other thing to note, um, right, so that's the, we've got that. The other thing to note is this. Again, we're going to need this. We're going to need that the solution is less than or equal to zero. And we also have, again, that the sum of the lambdas, for any of these lambdas, is going to be less than or equal to one. Now, it turns out that because of this, because w is inside of the polytope, and because each one of these lambdas themselves is between 0 and 1. And why is it between 0 and 1? Because again, we're sorting w and decreasing, right? So w, all of the lambdas, none of the lambdas are going to be out themselves outside of the range of 0 and 1. We have that for every possible lambda that's strictly non-zero, that f of e is equal to f of ei, the, the set in that chain order, in that chain according to w star, is equal, exactly equal to the evaluation of the submodular function, the minimum of the submodular function. Which basically means that EIs are, are also minimizers of f. And it also implies that the lambdas sum to 1. Now, why is this, why is this true? Actually, I have two slides on why this is true, because a lot of people find this confusing at first. Like, why does 17.47 hold? Um, the critical thing to remember, again, in all of these cases, is that this is true, that f of a star is, is less than or equal to zero. Now, why does that help us? Um, oh, one other thing I want to mention uh, is that um, the, the optimal solution is in the convex hull of the incidence vectors of the minimizers the incidence, incidence vectors of the minimizers of the submodular function. So we've got this lattice of minimizers of the submodular function. Each one of these points, each one of these points correspond to vertices of the hypercube. We take a, that, that essentially itself defines a polytope. And then the optimal con solution of the, con of the relaxation is, in, is a convex combination of these vertices of minimizers. So that's also a very satisfying result. But the question I want to sort of add a, put, spend a little more time on is why does 17.47 work? And after we do that, we'll, um, we'll, we'll break, I think, because we're running out of time. But um, the first thing to remember, again, is that f is normalized, so the minimizer is strictly non-positive. And we also have this is true. So all of these i's are no less than the true minimum. And we also have that f of a is equal to this mixture. Right? We have that. Now, there's two cases to consider. One case is if the minimizer truly is zero, right? Then that means that each one of these f's are going to be also non-negative. And so therefore, we're combining all of these non-negative EIs here. We're co whoops, we're combining them all here. And this thing here has got, it's got to be z zero, right? So if lambda i is greater than 0, then the corresponding f of ei has to be 0. So therefore, f of ei is also, f, f of ei star is also 0, and not, therefore optimal. So that's in this case when this is 0. OK, let's do the other case when, um, when f of a star is strictly negative. And suppose there's, there's an i such that this is true. Namely, that f of ei is strictly greater than f of a star. And f of a star is strictly negative now. Okay. So in that case, we would have f of a star, which is equal to this, right? just because that's the form of the solution, which is because there's, there's at least one ei. We, we, all, we know that this is true, right? So therefore, if it's the, the only possible other option is for a star to be strictly less than one of the f of eis. And in that case, it, it makes the whole sum strictly less. But now we bring this out here. But that means that because a f of ai is negative, this basically would imply the only way of achieving this equality, again, thanks to this negativity of f of a star, the only way of achieving that would be to set the sum of lambda i's to be greater than 1. That's the only way to get that. Because we've got, and this is the same picture that you were asking about, we've got this negative quantity is greater than that negative quantity times some value here. That would have to mean that that number is greater than 1, which is a contradiction. And so therefore, 
we must have that this is true. Okay. And there's another slide that says the same thing. The other thing, uh, the other thing to note is that, that this means that this sum is equal to one. Why? Because we've got, they're all equal to, and, and the only way for, to, to achieve this equality, this red inequality on the bottom right, is if, if the lambdas are a convex combination. If you don't like that explanation, there's a whole other slide which gives the same proof, but in a very different way. Because I've been asked this question a number of times. Okay. Um, I think that's, that's it for today. Uh, let me just ask one more time if there are any questions, because I would be happy to answer any of them. But what, what this does, what this means, is, is really potentially very nice, right? Because it means that we can do polyhedral convex minimization as a surrogate for submodular function minimization and, and get, it, get the solutions very easily. So if you've got a nice, if you've got your favorite convex poly, you know, polyhedral convex solver, you can just plug in your Lavas extension and get minima. On the other hand, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the fastest algorithm in the world. In fact, the min norm algorithm, the one that you're going to be implementing in practice, turns out to be faster. Although there's been some discussion about this and some believe that within the realm of the engineering, the natural engineering variance that exists when you're actually implementing a real algorithm, you could probably get any of, any of the, this, of the plethora of possible convex solvers to work as fast as any of the others if you're willing to spend enough engineering time implementing it correctly with good numerics and good matrix routines and machine cognizance and all of these other things that people need to do to get real code working on real machines. So we'll talk a lot about that on Monday when we talk about, uh, like I said, we'll, we'll go into great detail of, of the min-norm algorithm. So um, are there any questions? Okay, so I will see you on Monday.